Hi, so welcome everyone to uh, the third instalment in our uh, in our series of occasional online lectures that we call An Evening with Archeo Press. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with Archeo Press, we are a independent press based in Oxford in the UK, and we specialise in uh, archaeology and related heritage topics, publishing academic books. And uh, we're very grateful tonight to be joined by uh, Luca Borsic, from, uh, who's Director and Senior Research Fellow at the University of Zagreb, and Irena Radic-Rossi, Associate Professor at the University of Zadar. And they're going to be talking about their book, The Laburniums and Illyrian Lems, which I'm going to wave at you now. And um, I've, I'm going to shamelessly talk about discount because uh, I've already sent you a batch code through email. And uh, that gets you 25% off the print book, or it's also available as a, a PDF ebook from our website, which is archeopress.com. And the voucher code, uh, which I will send you again after the meeting, um, gets you 25% off, uh, off the book that we'll be talking about this evening, but also all Archeopress books, so anything else that you might find interesting on our website. So uh, I think that's, that's more than enough from me. I'm now going to hand over to Irena, and she's going to to the first section of this evening. So bear with me while I bring her on. So hello, everyone. Uh, I welcome you to my lecture, to our lecture uh, this evening. I'm very happy that Archeo Press invited us and we accepted gladly this opportunity to present our book. Um, I have to apologize because we are currently doing the field work. Uh, we are in the, at the island of Ignalic, uh, researching a shipwreck site from the 16th century. So I'm not in a fancy studio full of books. Um, I'm just in a research base, uh, but uh, I hope it doesn't matter. So I will start my presentation now. Uh, so the, the presentation is about our book, uh, Liburnians and Delirium Lamps, Iron Age Ships of the Eastern Adriatic. Uh, I will talk about the first part of the book, uh, where we put some introduction about the um, geographical uh, context and uh, about the historical context of the area. And we spoke about archaeological uh, icono and um, uh, iconographic evidence uh, about these uh, ships. We do not intend with our book to, to present the, the features of uh, Libunians and Illyrian lamps because uh, there is so little uh, in, in the archaeological and uh, iconographic sources. There is something in the written sources, but it is uh, so little that we cannot uh, attempt any reconstruction. Uh, we just wanted to point out that we are dealing with two different groups of ships, and uh, I will explain this through the presentation, and Luca will do it also. So we are three authors, uh, Luca Borsic, Daniel Gino, and uh, myself, and uh, we come from different fields of expertise. Uh, Luca is a, a philosopher. Uh, but he deals with the history of ideas and the history of philosophy uh, by discovering all the layers and explaining all the layers of this, um, this uh, history. And Daniel Gino is a historian. He is a Croatian historian, but working at the University uh, Macquarie in Sydney. And uh, he didn't, unfortunately, he didn't have the chance to join us today because uh, in Australia it is four o'clock in the morning. Uh, but of course, he is, um, he is supporting us and uh, put us in charge to present also his part. And I am archaeologist, so I was in charge to talk about material evidence in this book and I am personally involved in maritime archaeology uh, doing a lot of underwater research so basically spending all my time on shipwreck sites. Uh, 
as the acknowledgements, I just wanted briefly uh, to say that we are grateful for the Creation Science Foundation that uh, funded our research uh, through a four years project, Archaeology of Adriatic Shipbuilding and Seafaring. And we are grateful also to our institutions that supported us. But uh, above all, we are grateful to Raika Makjanic from Archeo Press, who supported our work all the time, to Evan Kopi and um, Gerald Prish uh, that uh, kindly edited our text, and to Adriana Pravidur, Tomislav Bilic, Ida Koncani Uhač, and Maja Bonacic Mandinic, who kindly gave us the opportunity to publish the pictures that they had on disposition. Of course, there is a number of people that are not here uh, in the, the acknowledgements that are not listed that contributed to the success of our research. So, uh, just briefly uh, about the geography, uh, geographical context uh, of our research. So, we are here in the Adriatic Sea. Adriatic is, as you all probably know, the great bay uh, that protrudes to the to the north from Mediterranean. So it is uh, it is situated between the Apennine and the Balkan Peninsula. And it is a very narrow sea, but a very long one. It is about 870 kilometers long and about 216 uh, kilometers wide. It has two different shores. So it has the eastern uh, and the western coast, and these coasts are very different between them because the Italian coast is very flat and uh, sand, mostly sandy. They have uh, the, 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 the Italian coast uh, is rich with lagoons and uh, marshland areas, etc. So, with some exceptions uh, uh, around Fieste and uh, around uh, Monte Gargano. And uh, the, the eastern Adriatic coast is uh, very well indented, so it has uh, a number of uh, islands, islets, and reefs, and the number is about uh, over 1,200. Uh, so uh, it is really a lot. And it means that it was, um, on one hand, very safe for seafaring, because there are a lot of protected um, bays and uh, protected channels, but uh, it is also very dangerous for seafaring because all those safe places can be safe shelters for the pirates or corsairs. There are sudden weather changes that can obscure the visibility and you cannot see the, all the, the reefs. And uh, so, so this coast was... Um, as Strabo writes in the, the first century BC to the first century AD, uh, was actually excellent for seafaring, but was not used for seafaring until his times, because of, he, he writes, because of the salvage population that was there, but there are also the, the other reasons that I stated. So here you can see the main uh, cities uh, stated and the, 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 the main, the biggest islands of, of this coast, but there are many, many more, as I already said. Uh, this is the historical situation. So the historical situation is uh, very interesting from one point of view. Uh, so, in, uh, during the last millennium um, BC, this coast was populated by a number of people. Uh, so, they, they started like tribes and they transformed themselves into nations, but uh, uh, we are familiar with some of them, like History Liburni, Delmatai, and the Illyrian Kingdom to the south. The, in the white, uh, the, some, some uh, names of people inhabiting the eastern Adriatic coast before the 4th century BC are indicated because all these people are not mentioned anymore in the sources uh, regarding the Roman conquest of the area. So in the previous scholarship, it was always said that everybody was Illyrian, 
that populated the eastern Adriatic coast. But it is not true. And recently, so let's say recently, Professor Katicic uh, did his uh, research on uh, Liburnian language and he reached the conclusion that history and Liburni were closer to vanity and they did not belong to the, uh, to the same group of people as the people to the south of the Eastern Adriatic coast. So the, the, the name Autariate that later does not appear in the sources basically transformed itself into the Illyrian kingdom. And those are the Illyrians of the time while uh, the other people uh, indicated here do not belong to the Liburnians, uh, to, to, to the Illyrians, sorry. And um, they, they, we, we cannot say with cer certainty uh, to which uh, group of people they do belong, but as I said before, their language was more similar and more cl closer to vanity than to other people from the area. So, uh, this is one of the reasons for the, 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 the great, uh, let's call it, mistake that was uh, present in the previous scholarship, in the previous bibliography, uh, that the Liburni and uh, the Illyrian Kingdom had the same ships. So that basically the ships used by Illyrians and called in the Greek and Latin sources Lambi, um, the were used were, were uh, a kind of ships that uh, Liburne from Liburnia uh, belonged to. So this this was the same group uh, of of ships that uh, just the, 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 the Liburne were the sub group of of uh, uh, lamps of. Uh, Yes, of this uh, this um, uh, great uh, group of of ships that were used by Illyrians. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, our book goes into the direction uh, to show slowly, step by step, that this that we don't have the foundations for such a conclusion. That basically, the two groups of people that one populated the northern part of the eastern Adriatic coast and the other populated the southern part of the Adriatic coast used the ships that were proper to their geographical area. Because Adriatic is composed of many, many different uh, maritime cultural landscapes. It is the term that was uh, introduced um, by uh, Christer Westerdahl. Uh, so the, the maritime cultural landscape um, uh, influences directly the, the ships, uh, shipbuilding and seafaring of the area. So this is, uh, this is uh, one thing that we have to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, when we talk about Liburni, Liburni were a very potent uh, population. So they uh, populated this northern side of the eastern Adriatic coast. And uh, here we have an old map that was produced by Professor Shime Batovic in 1977 that shows the network of uh, Liburnian hill forts. So uh, it is a very dense uh, concentration of, of these hill forts. And until now, you can imagine how this uh, map um, um, was actually integrated by other finds. So this uh, this uh, uh, these hill forts uh, are uh, very present on the uh, in this area. So it seems that there was no central um, central uh, city, central hill fort that would govern the whole Liburnia, but they they, they were uh, organized in smaller communities, and they were united just in. Uh, in uh, in the moments that uh, that it was necessary, uh, basically there was the perception of Liburnian talasocracy in the previous um, uh, bibliography 
because uh, there were some historical sources that pointed out to the to expelling of uh, Liburnians from the island of Corfu or from the, uh, the settlements in uh, Albania. But uh, uh, recently, uh, recent scholarship is against this idea of Liburnian talasocracy. So it means uh, Liburnian ruling over the Adriatic Sea. So uh, there are many things that should be said uh, about this uh, here, but it is better that you take the book and you read it. So I won't uh, spend uh, the time in explaining this, this, um, uh, this uh, problem. Uh, the, uh, but, you know, still, if the Liburnians were not ruling the sea, they were still very potent uh, and very skillful seafarers. And uh, this is, of course, uh, attested by the, confirmed by the, the uh, adoption of uh, Liburna, so their ship that they were using, into the Roman navy after the Battle of Actium. So this, these are some examples. So the, the hill fort of Barbaria with very uh, potent uh, defensive wall and the aerial view of Nedinum or Nadin, uh, where you can realize how uh, important were these hill forts and how important was this Liburnian uh, community. Um, these are the sites that point to the east, to the to the uh, to the, the arrival of Greeks. So, uh, according to Herodotus, we have uh, the, the people from Phocaea that sailed the Adriatic, uh, but they do not stop uh, in any place uh, permanently. We have some evidence on Palagruja, on this small island in the middle of the Adriatic, where the sanctuary of uh, Diomedes was situated. We have the evidence of Greek presence in the 6th century BC. And we have some other information about the Greek presence in those earlier times. But the, the real presence of Greeks comes just at the beginning of the 4th century BC, when uh, Dionysius from uh, Syracuse uh, establishes Issa, at the island of Vis, and uh, 10 years later, uh, the Greeks from uh, uh, Far uh, Paros, at the island, uh, uh, from the island of Paros in, um, in Greece, established the colony of Pharos. Uh, later on, uh, these two colonies uh, uh, actually uh, developed the, their own colonizing activity and they colonized a number of places here, as you can see, uh, Tragurion uh, and Epetion, then later Salona and Promontorium Diomedis is uh, another sanctuary uh, uh, dedicated to Diomedes. And uh, then the Isa had an attempt of uh, establishing a colony in Lombarda, for example. So there, there is a very intense uh, Greek presence from the fourth century uh, BC. And there is, of course, the influence of Greek seafarers directly on the neighboring, uh, um, neighboring people. Uh, the, the findings of such uh, helmets, uh, oh, this is the one, one uh, Greco uh, lyric, uh, so called Greco lyric type of helmet found at the, in the waters of the island of Tres. But there are also a number of finds uh, in front of Omish, uh, south of Split. Uh, that point out to some possible uh, conflicts uh, in which uh, the uh, the people the the, um, the people that inhabited the eastern Adriatic area uh, entered and probably also with the the the, the, the Greek um, uh, the Greek uh, newcomers. Uh, we can, we, we can never say that it is so, but just one uh, piece of evidence that uh, shows the possibility of uh, such a conflict, uh, although it could have been uh, a votive, votive offering or could have been simply lost. Uh, 
Uh, in this map, we have the, the evidence of, uh, of uh, uh, material evidence actually that speaks about the ships in this uh, first millennium BC. So it is not much. I have to say there is actually very little because we have some archaeological finds. So we have uh, Zambratia to the north, we have Pula, we have Tsaska and Zaton with the finds of real ships. Uh, we will soon come to these finds and we will talk more about them, but uh, we will see that they do not belong to the group of Liburnas, uh, Liburnians or to the group of Lembe, Lembs. So the, the, uh, we can add also to, to this map, uh, today we can add also porridge that is somewhere here, uh, between Zambratia and uh, Pula, uh, because uh, they recently discovered, uh, the archaeologists recently discovered one, son, son, one, one ship that belongs to the same group as the others uh, indicated on this map. Um, that was not known uh, when we published the book. Uh, then we have uh, the other uh, places, uh, the other indicated places that actually uh, uh, show the, the, the iconographic representations, uh, the, the, the places where the iconographic representations of ships were found and we will pass through them one by one. And there is the white, uh, th there are the white tags here on this map showing the places um, to which the finds of the coins with the representation of ships. So again, the iconographic representation of ships uh, belong. So observing this map, we see that we have a very scarce evidence. And if we start the presentation with the ship from Zambratia, so it is the ship from the end of the second millennium uh, BC. So uh, this is the, the ship that belongs to the late Bronze Age. And it is the oldest ship that was made by stitching, so by sewing, by sewing the planks together. It means that the planks were perforated along the edges and through those perforations the string was passed continuously and it was sealed by pitch and uh, so the, the, the seams were actually uh, closed in this case by the um, by the, 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 the small um, uh, the small pieces of uh, wood and the, the in other cases we have in other other ships that we will talk about uh, later there there is the vegetal string that seals the seams and across this the, the vegetal string passes so this ship uh, is the, the the oldest find in the Mediterranean of such a ship and uh, it is a, a kind of exceptional uh, find that speaks about the use of these uh, uh, ships, these boats uh, by the Histrian people uh, in the late Bronze Age. Uh, this is also the, the, the drawing of the hull, so you can see that it is just half preserved with three frames in place, etc., etc., but you can read more in the book. The second find and the third and the fourth, uh, so the, the other three sites belong actually to the uh, ships that are made by sewing, uh, so or stitching, lacing, lacing technique. And uh, these ships belong to the Roman period. So it means that the technique of sewing the planks together <clears throat> was uh, uh, su survived also in Roman times, uh, while it was already abandoned in the most of the Mediterranean. So it still survived on the western coast of the Adriatic, 
it's arrived until the late antiquity and probably the Middle Ages. But in the eastern coast of the Adriatic, especially in its northern part, it survived until the first centuries AD. It, it means that those ships were probably locally used, very locally for fishing and other uh, activities, and were uh, were used by the, uh, the the population that was present before the arrival of the Romans. So the two ships have their uh, characteristics that I would not explain now. Uh, one is a bigger one, it is about 15 meters long ship, the other one is uh, smaller, up to 10 meters, and uh, they are dated to the, um, to the first centuries um, AD. And uh, we have the other site, it, that is the, the Bay of Tzaska at the island of Pag. So we are moving now from the Histrian uh, Peninsula, so from Istria, to, uh, to northern Dalmatia. So in northern Dalmatia, we have the site of Tzaska. And in Tzaska, we also found the three sun boats uh, that also belong to the first centuries AD. So they were uh, actually one boat was dated by the uh, radiocarbon analysis to the uh, first, second century AD. And it means that it was probably scuttled in the second century AD. Uh, so the, the one ship of Tzaska is this one. It is very well preserved, uh, eight meters uh, long, but uh, probably up to 10 meters when it was sailing. Uh, although it was not possible to say what was the stern and what was the bow because the, the posts were missing and the, the mast step was also missing. So uh, we have no idea uh, how it was oriented. The remains of another sawn uh, ship were found as the material that was filling the, the bottom of another scuttled ship in Tzaska that was built by Mortais and Tenon Joints, so it is the ship that does not belong to this group of sun boats, but one part of the sun boat was thrown in order to reinforce the bottom before filling with stones, and this is this part of the, the hull. And the third sun boat in very, very um, uh, weak conditions, uh, I would say, so it was not well preserved, but it was uh, a nice find. Uh, it was uh, found again in uh, Tzaska, and it shows also some elements that could point to some uh, older tradition. This is the, 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 the find. And there is also the, the, the fourth site, and this is the site of Zaton, where the ship Nin uh, Zaton won and the ship Nizaton II were found, and recently uh, also the Zaton III. Uh, so the, one, one, the Nin I was dated by the, the, the coin of the Emperor uh, Vespasianus, and the, the ship Zaton II was dated by radiocarbon analysis to the third uh, or second century BC, so it is slightly uh, older than the previously discovered ships. But as I said, all these ships do not belong to Livornian uh, group of, uh, of uh, ships, and neither to, uh, uh, to, to, to the lamps, because they are called in written sources Cerilia. So there is the, the, uh, the uh, uh, written source, uh, Sextus Pompeius Festus, that um, quotes uh, Marcus Verius Flaccus, he is uh, writing in the second century AD, and he says that according to Flaccus, these ships used by history and Liburni are called Serilia. So the, the Romans were aware of the presence of these ships and they had the specific name for them. Uh, so they did not call them Liburne that were adopted later in the Roman Navy, but they attributed to them the specific name. 
Then we have the iconographic sources. So the the, I, the oldest source is uh, the griefs from Glasinats. Uh, the griefs from Glasinats that are dated to the seventh century AD. Uh, they are made of the breast protection. Uh, they're the, the secondary product, actually. Uh, uh, it was um, um, characteristic for um, the, the area of the Mati River in Albania. And those greaves have the four representations of ships here and here. But, uh, you know, there was the attempt of uh, connecting them to the later ships, but uh, there is a huge gap in centuries between these finds from the 7th century BC and the earliest written records. So we cannot say that they are actually representing the ships that were used by indigenous people. Uh, we can uh, presume that those are some... Uh, Greek influenced representations that point to the to the um, that that were actually put on the on the griefs uh, for some reason, but uh, there is no uh, no direct connection that could link them to the to the lamps or Ligurians. Uh, there is the Stella of Novilara uh, that is on the western side of the Adriatic. Actually, it belongs to the group of Daunian Stelle. Uh, and uh, there are several representations of ships. Uh, I will show just this uh, Stella of Novilara, and we dedicated most of the, the space in the book to this find. So uh, it represents the, the ships that are very similar to the ships from the griefs from Glasinats. But also this, uh, these representations um, cannot be with certain, certainty uh, uh, attributed to the Illyrian or Liburnian population. So this, uh, this is the 7th, 6th century BC and uh, the idea that they represent the, the Greek-influenced uh, ships uh, already appeared in the bibliography. There is another representation that uh, comes from Nesaktium, and Nesaktium is a, a hill fort behind Pula, so it, becomes to the, it, it belongs to the Histrian uh, population, and there is the stern of the ship, the stern of the ship that is rounded, as you can see on this uh, image, and there are some rowers and some warriors on the ship. So we have no idea what this scene actually shows. And uh, we cannot uh, uh, say again anything about the real attribution of the, the ship because uh, uh, it can be the simple decoration that was copied uh, from the northern Adriatic area. It can also represent the, the, the locally used ship, but we have no idea whether it is true or not. It is uh, around 500 uh, BC. And there is the belt buckle from Prozor, and Prozor is in the hinterland, in the Adriatic hinterland, so it is not on the sea. Uh, and on this belt bucket, uh, in the in the bottom of the, the, the this object, there is the representation of two warriors that uh, fight uh, one against another, uh, standing on the ships. Uh, so these ships are quite similar to what we will see on the uh, Illyrian coins. So they basically remind us of Illyrian uh, ships. That could possibly be lamps, but uh, this belt bucket uh, from Prozor. So Prozor is, uh, as I said, in hinterlands, but in the hinterlands of the northern Adriatic. But this belt bucket has the strong influence from the south. So probably it shows the ships that were in use in the southern area of the eastern Adriatic coast. And we have one more relief, and it is the relief from Varvaria that ended uh, in the front page of our book. So it is the symbolic representation of the, the uh, woman 
with the ship entering her, uh, penetrating her vulva, and it is the explanation of the the, uh, the authors of the the the, the, the short, short brief publication uh, is that the it is the the allegoric uh, representation of the port, the port of Scaladona and with the small uh, Varvaria uh, behind. Uh, there is a number of things that uh, speak about uh, the dating of this, uh, of this uh, object to the, the last centuries uh, BC, although we have no idea what is actually the, the real date of this object as it was found in the secondary position. But it is the only object that we have that belongs to the real uh, Liburnian community. So we cannot say whether this ship is uh, the, the real ship that was sailing in the Liburnian area or everything is allegoric in this representation, but still it, remain, it remains the only presentation from this area. And the, the, the things that were the, the most useful uh, were uh, these coins. So the coins uh, come from, uh, from the area that, that was inhabited by the Orsi and the, and the Labeati, uh, and uh, this is uh, this is the southern part of the, the the eastern Adriatic coast. So these coins bear the representation of ships from the third and the second century BC. Those ships are very specific uh, because they have these uh, elongations at the bow and at the stern area. They have the the bows that are um, inclined towards the, the, the inner side of the, the hull and not anymore outside as in the greaves of Glassinats or the Stella of Novidara. And these are probably the cut waters that, uh, that uh, uh, elongated the hull at the waterline that could have served uh, for um, for beaching the ships on from both sides, so from stern and from the bow, and possibly also uh, for sailing in both directions. So uh, if you read the written evidence about the lamps, you, you would always face the evidence of, uh, of ships that are very small, but very fast, very, uh, very, uh, agile, and uh, this could actually be something that we could think of as the main feature of these ships. Uh, the, this, these are some more representations of them. There are plenty of them, and uh, we can really um, say that probably in this case, we are facing the real representation of Illyrian lamps. Uh, there is one very, very uh, distant uh, uh, ethnographic um, uh, parallel to these ships, and this is the Moken Kabang, and uh, this um, uh, this uh, Kabang has the indentation uh, at the bow and at the stern. So the, the, the two parts of the ship are nearly similar and the bow side is uh, uh, metaphorically for, uh, for Mokens, uh, the part that eats the sea and the, the last, the, 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 the stern part is the anus that ejects uh, what, what is uh, left. So uh, this uh, this uh, 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 these uh, protrusions uh, are usually used to uh, to climb the boat uh, to climb the ship, and there is no uh, no mentioning of any other specific use in the bibliography. 
but we can imagine that probably it serves uh, in the same way as uh, we could have, uh, we could presume for the, the Illyrian uh, ships, uh, Illyrian names as well. Uh, the the Mokenkabang is the ship that is still in use and um, uh, in, by, by, by the side of uh, Burma. Uh, Okay, so I reached the, the part of the presentation that speaks about the written sources, and I would like to invite my colleague Luca Borsic to talk more about what he discovered in the bibliography. Thank you very much, Irena. I'm going to bring Luca on now. Hi, guys. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thanks for this wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, I would actually start my short, much shorter presentation by a kind of personal confession that mm, namely the following, working on this book was a very strange experience for me. Namely, if you remember when Irena introduced me, she said that I'm by profession a philosopher. And indeed I am a working, working as a philosopher, which means that my job description is more or less thinking. Whereas <clears throat> the others provide with material to think and to make conclusions. And when I say the others, I mean the real life, art, texts, other, um, yeah, such stuff. And here, working at this book, I was actually doing the opposite. I was collecting the material and uh, Daniel and Irena did the thinking. And I must say this uh, was a very novel and new experience for me and I really am grateful for that. And it was a very interesting experience for, uh, for me to work in, the, in this context. So when I said that I was providing with the material, what, what is actually the case? Here uh, on these slides and the, I guess next 10 or 12 slides uh, that follow the first one, you can see this is basically the summary of what I did in some 120 pages before that. So 120 pages precede those tables and maybe Irena, you can go, you can just uh, go through other slides like this. Yeah, I can show how it looks like. So this is more or less the summary of the sources. And before that, you, there are uh, sources describing dealing with the terms uh, lamps and the Burnias. So what did I do there? I covered, uh, uh, I did something that was impossible to do, I guess, 10 years ago. Namely, I used uh, databases and various databases, about 10 of them, uh, to go through ancient Greek and Roman sources, looking for uh, the instances of the terms Lems and Liburnians, and then I analyzed them. Uh, of course, uh, as I said, 10 years ago, without such wonderful databases as Thesaurus, Lingua Greca, and Brepol Series A and Series B, and et cetera, et cetera, and others, it would be impossible, or at least it would take like 30 or 40 years of one's life to go through all those sources. But with modern te technology, it was doable within a couple of years, I'd say. And mm, um, I covered, I found, 56 authors uh, which dealt, which were writing about the lamps, and about 27, much less, authors that wrote about Liburnians. Um, this difference uh, in number, why there are much more authors writing about lamps than Liburnians, can be explained in two ways. First, uh, uh, it is because, as I guess most of you already know, there are much more Greek authors preserved than Latin authors. And Liburnian were typically, as Irena just said, uh, were employed within the Roman fleet and Roman army. And uh, it was predominantly by Romans used, which means that uh, Roman authors dealt mostly with Liburnians. And there, is, there are much less texts preserved by Latin writing authors than the Greek Latin authors. And second reason is that um, uh, the term uh, Liburnian came into usage much later than the term lamp. Uh, so, uh, first instance I found, uh, maybe we can, yeah, here we have the first slide. The first instance we found on, on, uh, on the term lamp was from Demosthenes, the famous Greek orator from the mid fourth century BC. 
And the last one I found was Isidorus from Spain, from Seville, and this famous Entomologicarum Libri in the 6th century. So it was recovered approximately 1,000 years or 900 years period dealing with the lamps. Uh, the, uh, as for the Liburnians, uh, the first uh, mention, the first time it was mentioned, it was attributed actually to a very early Greek author called Hecataeus from the 6th century BC, but most likely this is not really authentic description because, of course, there is nothing preserved by this uh, author. We have only secondary or, or tertiary, tertiary sources uh, about Hecataeus, and this particular uh, source comes from a thousand years younger source by Stephanus, uh, who um, attributed the usage of the term Liburnian to, uh, uh, to Hecataeus, which I guess would simply not be possible. And uh, moreover, the first next mentioning of the term uh, Liburnian belongs to Philoxenus from Alexandria, which is first century BC, so 500 years later than Hecataeus. And so this gap of 5, 500 years would simply indicate that the term simply was not really used. So we should maybe neglect this first uh, earliest mentioning. And the last one, uh, the last time that we covered uh, Liburnian is by Zosimus in the 6th century AD. Maybe it's just a few words about this. Uh, how did I decide or how did we decide to go with the last, uh, last date? Um, it is a sort of arbitrary. Of course, what is the first, it is kind of clear. We go, you just go back in the history and look at for the first time that something is mentioned. As for the last one, uh, it was a sort of arbitrary choice uh, when we kind of decided that the terms lamps and Liburnians uh, started being used in such a derivative uh, sense that they some kind of conclusion about their original meaning could not anymore be made because as the time went by those terms were used in uh, they changed the meaning so much that they became almost unrecognizable in comparison to the first meeting uh, meaning so how did i uh, cover the sources before those tables as i said you have kind of 120 pages of text uh, uh, put in two columns uh, in the last column there is the original text on the right column there is english translation and about uh, uh, under the text under the uh, uh, greek latin translation text you have some commentaries on the text um, i used standard english translations if they were available if they were not available then i translated myself from ancient languages as best I, as i could um, <clears throat> um, Irena mentioned in in the beginning that uh, uh, my 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 job was contextualization, and this is really what sort of my philosophical also work is about. It's so-called hermeneutics, so hermeneutical interpretations, which is uh, trying to get the meaning of the whole by looking at the pieces, and and uh, trying to get the meaning of the pieces by looking at the whole, and sort of kind of circular analysis. And this is exactly what I tried to do here as much as it was possible. So maybe I should just give you a short example of how it looked like. Uh, for instance, um, if you go in the earliest, if you look in the earliest uh, Greek sources, uh, these are Demosthenes and uh, Lycurgus, the, the second famous German, uh, German sorry, Greek uh, uh, rhetorician and uh, statesman. Um, if you look at uh, those sources, uh, and if you know the context and how educated they were, for instance, uh, uh, the Demosthenes uh, besides being one of the best uh, uh, and uh, orators, which means that his usage of words was very careful and very well thought through. He was also, he dedicated at least six speeches to some specific maritime affairs, uh, like court uh, processes dealing with some sort of um, things with the sea. So it is, uh, it is very reasonable to suppose that his usage of uh, maritime terminology, names of the ships, was very careful and very precise. Uh, the same goes for, uh, for instance, for Lycurgus, who was also uh, not only extremely elitely educated, but also an expert in maritime stuff. So when he, when they speak and when they write about uh, lambs, in this case, we can take for granted, or we, we should understand that their uh, description of what is more plausible than, let's say, um, 
uh, Theocritus, who is another on this table you can see down there a little bit, who is a Greek uh, poet and who described uh, lamps very differently, but he was a poet and he was writing in uh, some very strange, bizarre, rare, rarely used verse called Glyconian Distichus, and of course he needed some words for ship in order to fit his metric scheme, and he, we can understand that his usage of the term was not very carefully chosen because he needed the word to fit his poetic, lyrical uh, pictures and so on. So, for instance, uh, Theocritus described uh, uh, lamps as a, as a fisherman's little boat, kind of little skiff, whereas, whereas the, um, the, the other guys, the Lycurgus and the Mustanus, they gave a much more precise description of a smaller ship that followed the bigger ship and it has certain functions and so on. And so on. Okay, and uh, so uh, at the end of my uh, talk, I would just maybe just uh, one more uh, thing to say that, so what did I conclude? What was the, what is the conclusion of all those 120 pages of text plus the tables? It's hard for me to say what would be conclusion beyond some sort of negative conclusion, namely that uh, what has been described in literature that lambs are and uh, Liburnians are related, there is no any textual evidence that would confirm that. So when I say negative conclusion, I mean that we can conclude that they were not related because uh, the sources describing them never ever link them together. Even the authors, the few, very few authors that uh, mention both uh, uh, Liburnians and uh, Lambs, these are Plutarchus, Appian, Zosimus in Greek, and in Latin Caesar and Pliny the Elder, they keep separately those two ships, they never link them together. So we can conclude that they were very different ships. As Irena also said, we can very we can conclude very little about how they looked like. Uh, most likely, lamp was a smaller boat, at least initially. But then, in the course of time, it could have also acquired different functions, especially military different functions. So it could become. Um, even bigger boats with some sort of catapults and can be used with some platforms or even some sort of cabins put on, on, on the ship and used for carrying people. And so occasionally in the literature, they were used even as a canoe or even bigger ships. So it's just simply changes with time. Whereas in the late antiquity, it became almost unrecognizable. Similarly, the case is also with Liburnians. Initially, it was used more precisely by Caesar and earlier authors as a kind of by reams, as a whatever by ream means, so two road ships. Whereas later on, it became sort of syn synonym for any type of military war ship of whatever size. It simply became warship in meaning. So, okay, this will be all for uh, my short presentation. Just last one mentioning. I hope, uh, I guess all of you not, uh, noticed uh, the front page uh, of our book. It includes a new English word, namely the word lamp. As far as we are conscious, this word did not exist in the English language before we published this book. So we hope also that this book will contribute to Oxford English Dictionary by adding a new word into the English language. Thank you very much. Yes, I have to, to finish this presentation by Great. just uh, saying that basically what you could have um, intended uh, between the lines is that we uh, tend to demonstrate that uh, Liburni and, um, and uh, Illyri uh, and, and the uh, Illyrians on the Eastern Adriatic coast used the two different uh, types of ships. Uh, those ships were called by the Greek and Latin authors, uh, lamps for Illyrians and uh, Liburne, Liburnike or Liburnians, uh, as we say in English, uh, for Liburni. Uh, whether the, the term lamb uh, is of Illyrian origin or not, we cannot say, uh, because uh, even the, um, the linguists like uh, Krache had problems to demonstrate that, those word, uh, that this word is of Illyrian origin. But uh, Lucas uh, dedicated research uh, into uh, Greek uh, bibliography actually um, brought us to the conclusion that 
probably it was the the word that was already existing in the Greek language, and the Greek authors just grabbed the most uh, suitable word to depict the Illyrian ships. So basically, uh, we have the, those uh, lamps. If you if you if you check the bibliography accurately, you see that the lamps are everywhere and they are used for many different things. And the Illyrian lamp could have been a specific um, type of ship, but was named lamp by the, 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 the most suitable uh, term that the Greek authors had on this position. And the same as Liburna. So Liburna was, uh, Liburnian was uh, probably not the term, Liburna or Liburnica, uh, the, the term that was used by uh, Liburni, but the term that was attributed by the, uh, uh, the authors, Greek and uh, Roman authors, uh, that were describing the ships that were used by Liburni. So, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, putting aside the, the Serilia uh, ships, uh, the ships that were made by uh, sewing, uh, this is the specific group of ships that survived with this prehistoric technique into the Roman times. And they appear just to the north, just in the northern Adriatic. And if you remember, I said that the the, 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 the authors that mention them mention that they are used just by history and Liburni. We don't have any find at the moment in the, the south of the Eastern Adriatic. So putting aside those ships, we have the development of uh, shipping, of shipbuilding and seafaring that happens in the third, fourth, second century BC that probably follows what is going on in the rest of the Mediterranean. So we have those lamps, we have those uh, uh, Liburn uh, Liburnians that, that uh, are uh, built in the same uh, shipbuilding technique as the other Mediterranean ships because this area communicates all the time with Mediterranean and communicates all the time through the, 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 the Greeks, for example, through, through the Greek presence and then later with, uh, through the Roman presence with the rest of, of Mediterranean. And it should be very weird that it would not, uh, that it would not um, uh, follow what is going on in this uh, Mediterranean. Okay, uh, I hope that we expressed more or less what we, we, we wrote in our book and uh, we would be very happy if you would take the book and read accurately what we wrote uh, about uh, this uh, topic. As I said, we had no intention to uh, reconstruct the, the Lamb or reconstruct the Liburnian because we have no evidence in, in, in this moment for this. We will probably not find it in the written sources, but maybe once in the future we will find some iconographic evidence of, or some archaeological find that would nicely surprise us. Okay, thank you for your attention. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you to Irena and thank you very much, Luca, uh, for your contributions. Um, I always do this. I'm going to give you a little round of applause because we can't see or hear our audience. Our audience so uh, I'm going to do that on their behalf. Um, thank you to everyone who's sent in questions so far. Um, do please send your questions now if you if you have one, and I will um, I'll jump straight in if that's okay. Um, the first question is to do with um, where they were manufactured. Do we know much about where, where the shipyards might have been based? Uh, well, we have no idea about the shipyards. We don't have any idea about the shipyards even in Roman times, which would be much more probable to find them. But unfortunately, we, we have very, very little evidence of shipbuilding uh, in this moment. So we cannot say, we can eventually presume uh, that the ships, the Cerilia ships were built in the places or near the places where they were found, but where the Liburnians and lamps were built, we have no idea. Sure, thank you. Um, the, the ships shown on the coins, um, which, which did these belong to and where, um, have there been examples of these 
in other areas of the Mediterranean? Uh, so uh, there is one uh, one group of coins. So the, the, this group of coins is dated to the third, second century BC, and uh, they're always uh, they're coined uh, by the people that populate the southern uh, eastern Adriatic coast. We have also the Botian coins that bear the same representation of ships and uh, it is the area that it that faces the, the the Aegean and we can uh, we can presume that uh, maybe this could be connected with uh, uh, Philip uh, willing to build the fleet and ordering 100 lamps to be built for his needs so maybe these ships built by uh, by the Macedonian king uh, influenced the, the the shipbuilding in the area, and they ended up on these coins. And no other coins are are known from this uh, Mediterranean world that represent such ships. Thanks, uh, Catherine Tia asks why um, Isidore was not used as the last source for both terms. Um, was Isidore avoided for the Liburnian because of the somewhat innovative interpretation, because of his somewhat innovative interpretation? Maybe, yeah, that's, I guess it, it goes to me. It, it, it just at this moment, I, can, I I cannot really exactly recall the, the place where he mentions the Liburnians, Isidore mentions definitely lamps, as far as I remember his, uh, but this, this is just the top of my head, I should just look at, at, at the, uh, back into the Etymology Carum Libri about the, the, the Liburnian, but I guess it was the, the reason that we stopped at the moment when we realized that the word Liburnian was used just generally as any type of warship or any type of so it made no sense just to repeat all these warships altogether. But uh, as I said, I, this should be, I should check back if I cannot speak just out of my memory about that. Yeah, no, sure. <laughs> um, next question comes from Miles Robinson. Um, how does your representation of um, Liburnian Illyrian ships um, differ from, with the, with the mouth and anus, differ from typical representation of Greek ships from the same period? Uh, most representation of Greek ships seem to be fighting ships as opposed to fishing boats. Uh, sorry, I didn't get exactly the, the question. I can try uh, so to I, reply. I, I, I think how do they how do they differ from the typical um, representation of a Greek ship? I think is the, the crux of the question. So the only representation that we can actually attribute to to this uh, group of lamps of Illyrian lamps are those representations on the coins because all the other representations are just partly preserved and they cannot be for sure attributed to the certain area. So they, I said that the belt buckle from, from Prozor comes from the south, that the situla of Nesaxium is probably influenced by the, the North Adriatic area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the coins of the Illyrian population that they, they bear the clear representation of ships from the third, second century BC, and those ships differ very clearly from the rest of the Greek ships of the the, the known ships by those extensions on the bow and the stern. So those ships are uh, nearly symmetrical uh, to the bow and to the stern. They have those, we can define them as cutwaters, although in Mocking Kabang, they are not called cutwaters. They do not probably serve as the, the, as the derangations of the, 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 the line of the ship line on the, on the, of the, the, the water line of the ship. But um, still we can, we can presume that, uh, that it was uh, the, a kind of cutwater that extended the ship on both sides. If it was not so, maybe they were used for bleaching the ships, as I said, on both on, on both sides, from both sides, 
and maybe also for sailing in both directions. Those are all presumptions because we cannot be sure, but uh, those ships are very strange uh, if you look at them. But although we have the evidence, we have the ship model from Mohos that is much older, that is 3000 years BC, that has the same um, same shape, that has the, the, the this elongation at the waterline uh, to the bow and to the stern. So it obviously is the idea that is applied, but uh, for what reason uh, we can just uh, attempt to, 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 to understand. Thank you. Ships in the photos uh, of the excavations look, look very flat bottomed. Is this the case or is, have they been uh, flattened out in their time uh, underwater? They're flattened. They're all flattened by the passing of the, the time by the pressure from above. And uh, yes, they, they are completely flat. You find them completely flat, but it does not mean that they had completely flat bottom. Thanks. Are the uh, Liburnian ships actually mentioned in connections with the Liburnian people in any of the sources? Yes. I mean, they, they, are, they are always mentioned in connection with Liburnian people. Yes, Luca can say something. Yeah, I'm glad they are mentioned, uh, except uh, um, there is one. Uh, I think there is one source that uh, mentioned that uh, Liburnians is actually a village in in Italy, I guess, nearby Rome. Where, where, sorry, it was this. <laughs> but otherwise, yes, it's mentioned with with with, uh, with Liburnians people. Yeah. Great, thank you. And um, we're coming towards the end of the question. So, if anyone does have another question, please fire them in now. Um, so, uh, Nicole Hirschfield says, the cut water and sewn technique reminds me of Marsala's shipwreck. Is there a possible connection? Um, I don't think so, because the, 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 the Marsala ship uh, um, has this uh, extension just in one, on one side, and uh, I would not say that there is something that connects the, 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 the two ships. So the, the, the Punic ship from Marsala and the Illyrian lamps uh, were probably uh, belonging to different uh, maritime cultural landscapes, to different uh, areas, uh, to diff they, they had the different purposes and uh, I don't think that they, they could be connected. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for, for all your time this evening. And um, I think that just about wraps us up. So um, I'm going to wave the book one more time. That We've had a wonderful introduction to you this evening. And as I said, I will send around the uh, vouch code one more time. Um, that will get you 25% off the print book or the, um, the e-book edition. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you, everyone, for coming to watch. And uh, the YouTube version of this will be up within the next few days. Okay, thank you for okay. having invited us. You're very welcome. And Luca, sorry, did you want to just say something quickly? Uh, I've just seen a message flash up. Oh, you're, you're, no. you're muted, Luca. Sorry. You're muted. Yeah excuse, yeah, excuse me, excuse me, sorry. Uh, so I was just checking the, the Isidore's text, yes, and it was, uh, yeah, I just, just re wanted to remind myself about this text, and it truly is a very bizarre uh, moment when he speaks about, and we kind of excluded it because he speaks about that uh, Liburnus comes from Libyans and, and a completely strange etymology, but puts it in the in, in the group of, 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 of warships in general, which means, of course, that this is simply, I, we didn't think it would contribute anymore to this general understanding of or original meaning of Liburnians. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for adding that in. Um, I've forgotten whose question that goes back to now. That goes back to um, uh, Katrin's question earlier. So Katrin, if you're still with us, thank you very much. Oh, she, she's popped up to say thank you. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to say goodnight to you guys. Thank you again for all your time, and thanks for uh, thanks audience for for coming and watching. And we'll see you again soon. Good evening. Thank you, guys. Bye. Okay. Bye. Good evening. Bye. -bye.